We're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. We're going to let a few more people join us. Welcome to the APTO um, Professional Development Series. So we just wanted to let you know that we are here and we will get started shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brooke Ben Scooter with the Association of Food and Drug Officials. And we'd like to thank you for joining us today at, for this um, episode of the AFTO Professional Development Series. Today, we have the guest. Um, today, our guest is Deborah Bloom. She's going to discuss the Poison Squad. Now, for those of you that were at AFTO's conference last summer, you got the treat of seeing Deborah in person. She delivered the most engaging and interesting um, keynote that actually I've ever witnessed. And I really um, am excited to have her here today as a speaker. She is the director of Night Science Journalism, the program at MIT, and she's a Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist, columnist, and she's also the author of six books. The Poison Squad is the name of one of those books. It was a 2018 New York Times notable book, and it was the subject of a um, PBS documentary as part of the American experience earlier this year, which was also a fascinating program. And uh, Deborah's expertise was sprinkled throughout the program. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deborah. Uh, we're excited to have you here today and eager to uh, learn more about so much about uh, the history of food safety. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, my talk at the AFTO meeting in Atlanta last summer was really a highlight of the year. I, you know, I've talked to so many people about what a good experience that was. Uh, it just, you know, it's great for someone like me to talk to people who get the material and, and allow me to explore it in such interesting ways. Uh, so I'm going to start by just talking uh, about a couple of things that brought me to this book, which would not be in my uh, biography necessarily. I've been a toxicology journalist for about the last decade. I um, was a failed I, what I describe as a failed chemistry major as an undergrad, uh, loved the classroom, was a klutz in the lab, basically, and, uh, but, and went off into a career of journalism and eventually returned to chemistry because it's still my favorite science and wrote uh, The Poisoner's Handbook, um, which came out in 2012 and which was about the invention of toxicology and followed it up with this book. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I landed here. In this period that I was writing about toxicology, 
I wrote a column, a blog for Wired called Elemental and a toxicology column for the New York Times called Poison Pen. And I was really exploring different aspects of toxic chemicals in our everyday lives. And, and I am the kind of journalist and science historian. Um, my last four books have all been histories of science who is very interested in the science of everyday life and who also, and, and that, that will play in this book, believes that we don't understand where we are unless we understand how we got here. And so while I was exploring different issues in toxicology and the history of poisonous substances, I started seeing references to this very unusual public health experiment uh, which was nicknamed the Poison Squad by the Washington Post. And I thought, well, what's that? And as I looked a little further, I, I realized that probably unusual is an understatement in a description of this, because it really is an experiment in which a chemist, Harvey Washington Wiley, who was the chief of the Bureau of Chemistry at the USDA, uh, decides to just directly test suspected toxic food additives on his co-workers. The volunteers for this series of experiments were young clerks and entry-level employees at USDA. And I thought to myself, why would anyone get to the point that they thought the answer to a problem or a question in science was to poison their co-workers? And that really led me into the exploration that became this book. Uh, next slide, please. And so as I started looking, what I re look, realized or, or started investigating was what food looked like before the 1906 Food and Drug Act, which was the act that Wiley was so fundamental in support and promoting and crusading for, and I'll get back to that. I, I found, took a deep dive into the subject of 19th century food. And I put this slide up here because to me, it represents the sort of rosy glow mythology that we, and by we, I mean, you know, the average American like me tended to cast over the food of the past, our happy, healthy ancestors kind of frolicking around with their farm fresh food. And, and in fact, that was true if you lived on a farm, I imagine, but for many, many, many Americans, that was completely not true. And the large reason for that is this is an unregulated landscape of food. The federal government does not regulate food safety, food standards, food manufacturing, uh, does not require labels on food, does not prosecute people if the food turns out to be dangerous or even fatal. And so you have this landscape in which unscrupulous food manufacturers really can do whatever they want. And in fact, they do. Next slide. Um, and this is not a problem that just existed in the United States. This is from the cover of a book that was published in 1820 in England, and it's really considered sort of the foundational book. It's uh, 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 written by a German food chemist named Frederick Ackham, and the title of a book is A Treatise on Food and Their Adulterations. And this book really, in the early 19th century, starts laying out a case for the fraudulent and dangerous manufacture of food. And in fact, by the mid 19th century, I want to say about by the 1860s, uh, the UK where this was published had a venture, had in fact come up with their first food safety law. And uh, this book particularly looked at the addition of heavy metals into food, the use of arsenic as a green food coloring and everything from candy to cake decorations, the use of lead, both uh, red and yellow to color everything from cheese to candy again and, and railed against it. And in fact, the UK food law was really precipitated when there was an incident in the north of England in which almost, I wanna say 
somewhere between a dozen and two dozen children died from eating arsenic tainted candy. But even with that awareness, nothing like that happened in the United States. Next slide, please. And so in 1883, and this is in fact a photograph from 1883, an Indiana food chemist named Harvey Wiley moves to Washington DC to become the chief chemist of the US Department of Agriculture in, in a tiny, uh, fairly low profile little office called the Bureau of Chemistry. Um, and Wiley, if you look at this photo is the, uh, the tall man kind of slightly to the right, three in from the right, wearing a boulder hat and looking kind of swashbuckling. And this, this photograph represents every chemist at USDA in 1833. You know, it was a small outfit, very 19th century, very white, very male, and, and very dedicated really. Uh, but one of the things about this particular group was that they had never really done any chemical investigations of food safety until Wiley came into the office and, the, and their mandate was, you know, broader than food safety. They would look at everything from pesticides to soils to, I mean, you know, so they were looking at a lot of agricultural issues. But Wiley came in, he had done a study of uh, food fraud with sugar uh, honey and syrup while he was in Indiana. He was the first professor of chemistry at Purdue. He came in with this sort of crusader mentality about this. He was, his father was an evangelical preacher in Indiana. He had been raised with the idea that it would, should be science and the service of good. And he was sort of morally and fundamentally outraged by the fraud that he had already found. So he put his team of chemists on this mission to investigate the quality and the safety of, of food. And they published a series of reports, which are called Bulletin 13, in which they looked at everything from dairy to cocoa, to coffee, to spices, to alcohol, to canned vegetables, to uh, lard and, and meat products, and just found this incredible landscape of cheating and toxicity. I mean, reading these reports, even in scientific language is like a journey into really creative food fraud in particular. Uh, next slide, please. Deborah? Yes. This is Brooke. I wanted to jump in here for one second and let people know that they can ask you questions. You've agreed graciously to take questions at the end of your presentation. And so there's a question box where you can put in questions and we will answer those at the conclusion of uh, Deborah's presentation. Sure, I love that's actually the question and answer part of it and always makes me think. I'm going to move fairly quickly over this slide, but just to give you a sense of what things were like in the 19th century, this is a photograph of a candy factory. And as you can see, uh, you know, they were, and Wiley's guys would go out and occasionally review these. So this is from uh, the actual archives of that office. And as you can see, uh, you know, hygiene was not exactly number one in these. And the page to the right is from uh, uh, the notebook of one of these inspectors. And if you can kind of get into that longer graph in the middle that starts colored candy, you'll see that it cites two children dying. And that was because of the arsenic in the candy. This was an ongoing problem until the government finally moved in the early 20th century to bar the use of arsenic in food products. Next slide. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about fakery. So in addition to, you know, the, the sort of fake products or the fake contents that I'm going to talk about, there was also widespread fraud in advertising. And so you could do something like this without any blowback. You could pretend that your coffee was nutritious and you could market it as somehow I'm not actually sure what you would put in coffee to make it super nutritious, but you could just put this on the label and everything was fine. Next photo, uh, next slide. 
Uh, but I did want to talk about fraud in coffee because when Wiley's uh, group of chemists went out and analyzed coffee, they found that somewhere between 70 and 90% and of the coffee available in the country showed some form of adulteration, meaning that when you opened your can of coffee or if you analyze what was in that ground can of coffee, uh, you would find some coffee, you would find a lot of other substances. And if you look at this can to the far left, the coffee essence, cafe essence, uh, you did not have to put any coffee in that, actually. Uh, that was actually a sort of legal dodge by manufacturers. If you just called it essence of coffee, it could contain whatever you wanted it to contain. Um, in the case of these other kinds of coffee, what you would find is some ground coffee, but the chemists also found uh, actually charred ground bone. They found lead dyed sawdust, dyed with black lead. They found burnt rope. They found sweepings, they found dirt, they found ground, and, and this would be something you would find in coffee that said chicory, but they would find a lot of like charred seeds and things, and so very little of the actual coffee. And one of the things that happened was that as consumers started worrying about what was in their ground coffee, they started grinding, uh, going out and buying coffee beans, uh, instead thinking, well, those would be real coffee. And so you saw then a new cottage industry and fake coffee beans. And you can actually find the recipes for these fake coffee beans. There were molds for sale and they were usually uh, filled with a mixture of something like dirt and wax. Um, and you can also find the circulars that went out to grocers because grocers would have big barrels full of beans that customers could can, you know, scoop out and they would say, hey, we can multiply your profits if you just mix in our, our so-called coffee beans. Next slide. And spices were equally bad as if not worse in some cases. And this was certainly true um, if you go back to this time period beyond the federal government, there's a lot of really great work at the state level by food chemists. Uh, and actually the Association of Food and Dairy Officials, which is a forerunner of AFTA, you find these wonderful crusading uh, progressive food chemists in places like uh, North Dakota and South Dakota and Wisconsin. Um, but you find these guys finding the same thing, up to sometimes 100% adulteration. So pepper, again, would have some of the similar ingredients that I was just mentioning in coffee, but often uh, ground coconut shells were very popular with pepper. Uh, cloves would be brick dust in particular, cloves and cinnamon and those reddish spices. And I actually, I run a science journalism fellowship program at MIT, and I had a fellow from Romania this year who said that her uh, grandmother had told her that that was still a problem in Romania, that when you went and bought spices at the farmer's markets, you ought to be very careful about who you bought them from, because even today you could get a healthy dose of brick in your cloves and cinnamon. Next slide. So as people start being aware of just how fraudulent food is, not that there's any regulatory measures, but as people become more and more aware of the amount of fraud in food, you see manufacturers counting by just changing their labels. So they would say pure spices, right? Whatever those are. Or if you go to the next slide, um, you would also see pure rye whiskey. And here you see this particular manufacturer, you know, sort of redundantly saying it's pure, it's not blended, it's not adulterated, it's pure rye whiskey down in the very last line. And, and that was also true with alcohol. There was a great deal of fraud in the whiskey industry in particular. Also, as Wiley and his chemists discovered in wine and beer, uh, largely by using uh, synthetic ethanol and dyeing it and flavoring it. And in some cases with whiskeys, they would even add an, a compound that would make it, you know, kind of cling to the glass the way a good whiskey will. So, and then they would sell it as aged dry. So you start seeing this aggressive response by the manufacturing industry to try to reassure consumers. Next slide. 
uh, without necessarily actually changing what was in the product. And so I want to briefly mention, although this is not a major subject of the book, you know, we talk about the 1906 Food and Drug Act. And the other issue, of course, was the unregulated use of narcotics, drugs, and other uh, over-the-counter snake oil kind of remedies. And uh, one of the things that you found in the late 19th century is uh, Mariani wine, which was cocaine-infused wine, right? And there was this ongoing idea that cocaine in particular was just this wonderful drug. If you would go to the next slide, you would also see that in things like Coca-Cola, this is uh, from the original manufacturer of Coca-Cola, John Pemberton. Uh, Coke was uh, became the giant industry that it is today when it was per purchased by the Candler family in Georgia. But Pemberton was the original proprietor in Atlanta. And if you look at this advertisement, he's really saying, you know, the stimulant properties of the coca plant, right? He's not even messing around with the fact that this was cocaine. And you also found narcotics like both cocaine and morphine and, um, you know, set it, uh, drugs for children who were teething and in cough syrups. I mean, there's this widespread use of unregulated narcotics and also a great deal of fraud and over-the-counter remedies. And I should mention briefly that um, Coca-Cola took cocaine out of its product, I want to say about 1902, but that was the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia, under pressure from the WCTU and other advocacy organizations, eventually just said, you cannot put cocaine in this product. Coca-Cola responded by ramping up the amount of caffeine to the point that a six ounce bottle of Coca-Cola was about the same as a 16 ounce can of Red Bull today. And so eventually Wiley actually sued the Coca-Cola company. And, and I write about this in the book, I'm not gonna discuss it, but there's this really insanely great lawsuit that puts caffeine on trial about 1911. Um, next slide. But I want to focus on uh, the dangers of the food supply briefly too, and I and I'd really like to do that by talking about milk. This is a cartoon by a very famous newspaper cartoonist, uh, Thomas Nash, who was most famous for doing cartoons about political corruption. But this is a cartoon of a dairy man ladling out milk to a family at a food market. And as you see, the dairyman is a skeleton. Now, why would that be? Well, milk was dangerous for all kinds of reasons in the 19th century. It was unpasteurized. We didn't really start pasteurizing milk in this country in, in a kind of full force way until the 1930s. Um, and there was a, a quite a, a crusade by public health researchers in Washington, D.C. for that in the 1920s. Um, so milk is unpasteurized. There are a lot of pathogenic bacteria in milk. There's no real refrigeration. We don't have electricity. If you have enough money, you can afford ice. Uh, so the milk rots fairly quickly, further uh, encouraging the growth of bacteria. Next slide. Um, but uh, the other thing that's going on, and this is also a Nash cartoon, is that dairymen did a lot of things, and that's what they were called at the time, they were called dairymen, uh, to, to increase their own profit margin. And, and the simplest thing they did was water the milk. So this is a cartoon in which you see the dairyman standing behind their pure country milk cart, watering down the milk. Uh, and you can find the formulas of the percentage of milk um, per, to water that was, was sort of standard. Uh, the dairymen were not particularly careful about, you know, cleanliness to begin with at this time. This is before we really obviously understand microbes. And they often just used any old milk. And one of my favorite examples was an analysis done out of uh, Indiana. Um, by the public health officer there in which they found that the milk was full of horsehair worms because this particular dairyman had just been scooping up the milk to mix with 
uh, the water to mix with the milk out of the pond behind his farm. Um, and then because the water was, the milk would be so watered and the, it would turn kind of bluish, they would recolor it either with chalk or plaster of Paris. And occasionally, especially in the Midwest, they would fake the cream on top by pureeing calf brains, which made a kind of creamy yellow layer and floating it on top of the milk. Um, and the only problem with that is that the milk cream would then curdle in your hot coffee as the brains got hot. Uh, next slide, please. And the other thing that started happening in the dairy industry is to counter some of these problems with bacteria and rot, uh, they started using uh, a very popular embalming agent from the Civil War, formaldehyde. And formaldehyde had proved to be a very good embalming agent during the Civil War. And, and the members of the dairy industry had literally said, uh, wow, this does such a good job at preserving a rotting human corpse. So what would it do for our milk? And it worked really well. Uh, I'm told, although I haven't tried it, the formaldehyde has a fairly Swedish taste so uh, that it would counter some of the sour taste of rotting milk. A and it actually preserved the milk pretty well. You can find ads from the time for, uh, you know, milk that will last two weeks just sitting on your counter, which sounds kind of horrifying today, but probably sounded like the magic of science back then. And so uh, Dairyman gets very enthusiastic about this. There's no rules, there's no standards for how much formaldehyde you can put in the milk. The formaldehyde was uh, sold as formulas that sounded fairly benign, like preso you know, preservaline or rosaline or icine. And uh, they just start adding more and more. If a little is good, you know, if I added more, would my milk last even longer? And so you start across the country seeing these kinds of news stories in which children become sick or die uh, because of the levels of formaldehyde in the milk. Um, and they were embalmed milk scandals. Uh, in Indianapolis one summer, I think they had 400 children who died from uh, the levels of formaldehyde that, in milk that were circulating in the city that time, and that was about 1896. Next slide. And uh, you see this use of formaldehyde and other preservatives, borax, which we you know see now in the cleaning department was a popular meat preservative, as well as formaldehyde. And eventually this becomes such a problem that, next slide, um, you get a huge scandal. This is a cartoon about the beef trust that followed the scandal. And if you look at the uh, you know, labels on the meat, you see deodorized ham and um, other horrible thing, putrefied pork. Uh, this really followed a scandal uh, about in 1898 after the Spanish-American War in which some of the officers accused the army of killing more of the soldiers in Cuba with their food than, than the Spanish had done. And they particularly focused on meat and the uh, use of both formaldehyde and borax to preserve meat. And the army ended up having a hearing in which they concluded that yes, there were a lot of bad things in the meat and the meat was really horrible, but hey, the army was not responsible because this was exactly the same as the canned meat sold in the everyday American grocery store. So we're, and, and they basically said, we're off the hook. This is standard American practice. Next slide. So Wiley, uh, and that's is obviously later in his career. This was taken about the time he launched those poison squad experiments in, uh, he started them in 1902. He called them the hygienic table trials. Uh, poison squad was not his name for it. And I just really like this photo because it's a publicity photo. And because they didn't clean up the trash on the floor, which no one would ever let you get away with today. Wiley decides that they've got all of these problems, these obvious problems, problems that have been documented by him now for almost 20 years, it's 1902, without getting the federal government 
despite numerous efforts to pass any kind of minimal regulation or even to put labels on products that lets people know that there are these additives in the food in, in case, for instance, and he writes these this in the bulletin 13s, you know, it, you, we could have sick people eating these things. We could have children eating these things. They're getting a cumulative dose. We don't even know what the dose is because we're not setting standards for amount of these compounds in the food, let's at least label the food, but the federal government refuses even to do that. And the many efforts at a food and drug law fail. And finally, he decides, I'm just gonna actually safety test this. And, I, and in the way that public health was at the moment, which was fairly primitive, I'm just going to get volunteers and I'm gonna feed them this. And so next slide. He starts these poison squad experiments. He builds a dining room in the basement of one of the buildings at USDA. He hires a professional chef and he does this experiment in which basically, I'm oversimplifying the way he did this, but you would have two tables at any given time of volunteers and one table would be eating wonderful farm fresh food. I mean, they went out of the way to make sure this was genuinely pure food uh, cooked to a tea. And the other table would be eating that same wonderful food, but they would be swallowing capsules with different doses of the additives that he wanted to study. And they would run these comparisons for weeks, they would give them a break, and then they would come back sort of, sometimes changing the volunteers, rearranging the tables, and then they would start on another compound. Um, and the first compound they tested was borax. And Wiley picked borax, uh, which we see now, you've probably seen 20 mule team borax in the grocery store, uh, because he thought it would be safe. He didn't want to start out by killing people. He wanted to pick something he thought was benign. Next slide. And so this is from the New York Times, not the Post. Um, this you start seeing uh, this very uh, uh, early 20th century kind of language in the newspaper with the multi duck hat, deck hat, and the many descriptions. But what you will see if you look at this text is that the borax made these volunteers sick, um, and the description in the story refers to it as a poison. So a couple of things happened, starting with Borax. Uh, Wiley was shocked when these volunteers became so sick. And he said that when he testified to Congress, he said his uh, research actually made him a convert. And, and a lot of people were shocked actually. And the US Borax companies to undertook, as would happen throughout Wiley's career, a major campaign to discredit him and smear his reputation. But uh, the government published this report and they moved on to other compounds. They looked at salicylic acid, which we know because it's related to the compound that makes aspirin and the problems there and again found problems. They looked at formaldehyde. They had to call that experiment early because people got so sick and they started marching through these additives. And the really important thing I think about this is not that this is a perfect experiment. You can go back, especially from a 21st century perspective and really look at some of the flaws in the way this experiment was conducted, but that it did illustrate that there was risk and that it caught huge public attention. It wasn't just now that the New York Times and the Washington Post was looking at it, but as I detail in the book, you saw coverage you know, in big newspapers and small newspapers around the country. There were poems, there were minstrel shows, there was this sudden increasing wave of outrage as people start to realize that they cannot trust what's on their table. That some really bad things are turning up in just about every meal they eat. Next slide. Wiley has some really remarkable allies in this. Uh, one of them was Henry J. Hines. This kind of modern looking illustration is from a story I did about that. Uh, for National Geographic, but Heinz uh, took on the cause of pure food, you know, partly as a commercial thing. He thought it would make him stand out from his competitors, and he actually sent his company on a quest to make 
a preservative free ketchup. And in the course of doing that, ketchup of the 19th century had been a kind of watery, very thin vegetable dye, dyed vegetable slush, right? They used apple peelings, they used pumpkin rinds, they mushed them up. They were often kind of rotten. They put in a lot of borax and also sodium benzoate, and then they would dye them with a cultural dye to make them red. Heinz came up with this new formula, which used a lot of the natural acid of tomatoes. So he needed a lot of tomato pulp and used vinegar to kill bacteria and essentially invented modern ketchup in his quest for a, for a pure ketchup. And he also put a lot of money into uh, promoting the pure food movement and, and had members of his staff meet with Teddy Roosevelt as there becomes this push to try to get Roosevelt, who was very resistant to this issue, to sign on. Next slide. And the other uh, group of allies I want to mention that Wiley tapped were, uh, uh, the, was the women's movement. And I want to mention both of these guys because I can sound like Harvey Wiley was, you know, the lone crusader, but there were a formidable group of people, including the food and drug chemists from states across the country, including uh, some manufacturers, including pure food advocates, there were pure food congresses, cookbook writers like Fanny Farmer, um, who actually wrote chapters in their cookbooks about bad food. And Wiley deliberately brought in uh, women's clubs um, who were very organized. He worked with suffragettes. He actually married a suffragette eventually who was arrested and went to jail for picketing for the women's right to vote. Uh, and I just admire that about him because women didn't have the vote at this time, but he saw them as what they were really organized, uh, uh, really organized groups who could get out um, people to pressure and they did pressure to spread the word and to educate people on the everyday level. And so he was very forward thinking in that way. And I want to give him credit for that. Next slide. Despite all this, and despite you see these cartoons, newspapers across the country, you know, Wiley is taking on all of these great causes and keeping food safe. Still nothing happens. The, uh, the, there's a very organized pushback by the manufacturing industry. Uh, and a very um, and a lot of money uh, given to members of Congress that uh, helped kind of stall off any legislation. In fact, there was a, a famous book written at the time that infuriated Roosevelt called "The Treason of the Senate" about the amount of corporate money that was persuading the Senate to hold, you know, push back on all kinds of regulations. But there is this slow burning fire. You know, people are more aware, they're getting angrier. And then, next slide, um, we get the kind of fuel on the bonfire, which is this book, uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Uh, Upton Sinclair was a socialist writer. He was a very underpaid writer who had probably because he was so underpaid, adopted, uh, become a socialist. And he got very interested in a meat a butcher strike in Chicago that was you know, pretty much stomped out by the meatpacking industry there. And he decided he would write a novel about the plight of the workers. Um, and they were the poor pitiful animals in the jungle. That's the origin of the title of the book in which the manufacturers of the predatory uh, animals in this in this scenario. And he actually published this book about the plight of the workers first in a socialist newspaper, uh, Appeal to Reason, which was based in Kansas, which was at that point a hotbed of socialism. Uh, I kind of love that. Uh, anyway, he publishes this as a serial novel. He then takes it and tries to get a New York publisher to publish it as a popular novel. He gets a contract from Macmillan. Macmillan kills the contract because one of the things Sinclair had done for this book is he had gone and lived for almost two months in the Chicago stockyard, um, you know, gathering information and interviewing people and just and and standing around kind of looking like an underpaid uh, packing house worker and uh, getting a lot of detail. And, and so the backdrop of the book is this horrifying description of the Chicago stockyards and the way meat is processed and the 
you know, rats that go into the sausage and the possibility that, you know, workers go into the lard. I mean, it's, you know, it's, and it's bloody and dirty and horrifying. And Macmillan killed the book. They're just, well, we're not going to publish this. And he eventually persuaded another publisher, Doubleday Page, to uh, do that book, but they fact checked it. They sent their own fact checkers to Chicago. Their fact checkers came back and said it's actually worse than in the book. And so they published the book. They sent a copy to Roosevelt. Next slide. And Roosevelt fact checked the book. He sent his own investigative team to Chicago. His investigators came back and said, this is worse than in the book. And Roosevelt used that. And this is what I think is really important to understand about The Jungle. The Jungle was a novel. Upton Sinclair meant it to be a call to arms for immigrant workers, actually. And he said famously that he had aimed for America's heart and hit it in the stomach because what everyone got out of this was the horrors of the packing industry. And the report that Roosevelt's investigators came up with, he used to blackmail Congress. Uh, he said, if you don't give me a meat inspection act, I'm going to release this report. And then when they still refused, he released a eight page summary of the report and the reaction to that eight page summary was so dramatic that uh, all, pretty much every country in Europe canceled their meat contracts with the United States and American consumers just walked away. And so under that kind of economic pressure, the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 passed in June of that year and buoyed by that tidal wave of outrage and, and reformist fervor, the Food and Drug Act passed about a week later. So both of those laws passed in June of 1906. Next slide. And this is a paradigm shifting moment in the United States because this is really the first time in the country's history and the US is well over 100 years old by this point. This is the first time in the country's history that at the federal level, the government says, yes, we're in the business of consumer protection, or as I sometimes think of it, yes. That clause in the Constitution that says promote the general welfare means protecting our citizens in their everyday lives. And so these two laws lay down the foundation for all consumer protection that follows, right? The EPA, the OSHA, all of the agencies that are engaged with consumer protection are built on the precedent of these two laws, the 1906 Food and Drug Act and the 1906 Meat Inspection Act. And they're very different laws. If you actually look at what happens, you if you actually look at them today, you'll see, for instance, that the Meat Inspection Act uh, gives much better funding to USDA for inspections than the Food and Drug Act gave to um, uh, the what would eventually become the FDA. Um, and, and so I'm just going to do a, a short bit of history and bring this to a close and open up for questions. Um, but what happens is eventually that the Food and Drug Act, through a lot of corporate interference and, and battles, um, eventually becomes, you know, so problematic that in 1938, we get a better law, the 1938 Food and uh, Pure, Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act. Wiley and the battles over enforcing the law eventually become so disillusioned and so under threat in his own agency that he quits. He goes and starts the testing laboratories at Good Housekeeping, uh, creates the Good Housekeeping seal of approval, writes this column, Common Mistakes About Food, and uh, continues to crusade for uh, better food and food safety and enforcement of the law until his death in 1930. And here you see a stamp honoring him, right, as basically the father of the FDA and, and the guiding force behind the Food and Drug Act. Next slide. He was a uh, remarkable person and, and a remarkably, uh, I think the kind of person and the kind of person who interests me as a writer, he was so single-minded, right? 
so focused on this one thing he wants to achieve that he's not always easy to deal with. But I like those kinds of people. I think it's important for us to remember that a single person can change the world and he's a good example of that. And, and this slide is just, I do a lot of talking to high school chemistry classes and a high school chemistry teacher, just to pull it forward to today, sent me this slide. He did an experiment in which he got cans out of, uh, peas out of a can. Um, and uh, the kind of gray green peas there are what the peas look like today without any of the early 20th century additives. And he then added copper sulfate, which was the common greening additive that was ba barred uh, under uh, the 1906 law. And you can see these beautiful spring green peas that result when you just dump a little copper sulfate into these peas. But going over to this, uh, other slide to the right, he then put a nail into a slurry of those peas, uh, nail head side down. And if you look, you can see that the copper is redepositing on the nail. So this is just a reminder uh, that these kinds of regulations that keep known dangerous substances out of food, that set standards for the amount that we can put in food, that require labels so that we know we hope what we're eating, um, that that stand for the average consumer, they really matter. They were hard fought in 1906. And I think we want to stand for them today in a Harvey Wiley way. So thank you very much. I hope that uh, that's a sort of super fast tour sort of the history, but I hope you found it interesting and I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thanks, Deborah. Um, as always, it's, it's just fascinating. I always learn something new every time um, I'm with you. So I have um, a few questions. The first is when looking back to 1863 and the crusade that Wiley undertook, what was the direct regulatory authority that they had to counteract to these, they had to counteract these fraudulent additives? Were there any laws in place to protect against this at that time? That's a great question. There were none at the federal level at that time. Um, literally, the Food and Drug Act of 1906 was the first time that the federal government moved to, you know, a sort of assert its oversight over um, food manufacturing. There had been a law, I want to say it was, there were a couple of laws in the 1880s. One had to do with uh, fraud and imported tea. And there was a, uh, the Butter Act, which attempted to kind of put some uh, rules around uh, the difference between margarine and butter. And, uh, and that particular act, more or less, the biggest thing it did was to levy an additional tax on makers of oleomargarine. Margarine at the time was actually made with animal fat rather than vegetable oil and to require them or try to require them to do honest labeling. But at the federal level, there was nothing. Uh, that was different at the state level. And you saw in lieu of federal, any kind of federal action, some of the more progressive states patch it, uh, passing some laws to try to control food additives. Um, Massachusetts passed one in the 1880s. Um, Indiana's, I think, passed about 1898 after some of these milk scandals. Uh, North Dakota had one. South Dakota may have had one. I, I mean, there was a whole patchwork of these laws at the state level. Uh, and then there were a lot of states that refused to pass any regulation um, whatsoever um, in, a, in a pushback. Uh, and also, you had a lot of states who pushed back against federal regulation. So at the time that Wiley took this on, even as he is generating these reports that say, you know, we've got all of these quality and safety problems, with the food supply, there was no really meaningful regulation until 1906 at the national level. Okay. So uh, another question is, how did arsenic find its way into the candy? Oh, that's a great question. 
So arsenic is one of my favorite examples of our kind of love-hate uh, relationship that we tend to have with poisonous compounds. Um, arsenic's a naturally occurring element. It's uh, the 33rd most common element in the Earth's crust. Um, and people discovered in the 19th century that, uh, that all kinds of use, uses for arsenic, I mean, had a really good reputation as a homicidal poison in the 19th century. Um, in Europe, it was actually known as the inheritance powder because so many people used it to hurry their inheritance. I mean, it's a great homicidal poison um, in that it's tasteless and odorless and you can mix it into food and it'll mimic the symptoms of a natural illness. And there were no um, actual toxicology tests to discover it in a corpse until about 1840. Um, so everyone knew that arsenic was dangerous, but they also realized that it had different valuable industrial uses. And you can, in a laboratory, treat arsenic um, with a couple of different reagents, and it will create a beautiful green dye. So in the 19th century, you saw a boom in the use of arsenic food coloring. It was used to color fabrics. It was used to color wallpaper. Um, there, there actually is a theory because they discovered that there was uh, arsenic in Napoleon Bonaparte's hair when they exhumed his body. Um, for a while, they thought he had been poisoned by the British, but the actual existing theory is that it was his um, arsenic dyed wallpaper. He was in a prison where um, he had this green wallpaper and it was near the coast and these um, salty warm um, air from the sea actually caused that wallpaper to off-gas arson gas. So you saw that and then it was used in uh, to color food. It was used in food dyes. It was used to color candy green um, and wow. at very tiny levels. It was very common actually. And it wasn't, again, you had the same kind of problem with it. I mean, it seems so insane today, right? But you had the same problem that arsenic at, you know, at a tiny, tiny level didn't cause acute illness, but you'd have uh, food manufacturers, there's no safety standards. Well, a little be, I'll make it an even brighter green, right? <laughs> and so it's like, you know, so you did see that in the same way that you saw I don't think there was as much acute toxicity because it's a different kind of poison, but you saw some heavy handed use of lead in candy as well and some lead related toxicity related to candy. But no, arsenic was an incredibly popular common ingredient. It was used in cosmetics. I mean, it's kind of fascinating. And, and there's a couple of great books about that. There's a, a toxicologist, he's particularly looked at, you know, uh, arsenic and rice, right? Because the rice plant it, it has a great transporter system for metallic elements. But he wrote a book, Andy Mehard, he's Scottish, um, wrote a book called Venomous Earth, which looks a lot at this. And then there's an environmental historian, James Wharton, who wrote a book called The Arsenic Century about all the different ways that you see arsenic used by Victorians. It's a great history. So it wasn't unexpected. It was really widely used and it really wasn't until you got again into federal regulation and people started saying, you know, this probably is not a very good idea and let's get arsenic out of the food supply that it went away. Okay. I have another question. I have heard that the meat packers were warned before they were visited by the Roosevelt Commission. Supposedly the version they saw that they came back and said was so bad was actually a cleaned up version. Is there any truth to that? Yes, that's completely correct. And interestingly enough, Upton Sinclair had been, you know, had a lot of sources back in Chicago and he'd been like talking to them during this whole process of setting up the investigation. And Roosevelt had told him to his face, Sinclair, 
that he didn't trust him and, and to you know back out of his business. Um, but uh, Sinclair went and met Roosevelt's two inspectors. One was a settlement house director from New York and one was a labor commissioner. And he actually met them on the railroad platform before they went to Chicago and told them that he had already heard that the meatpacking industry had been given a heads up and that they were going to clean up the place and and to be aware that they weren't going to see uh you know the real story but in fact this is my speculation i mean it was such a messy operation that even with that warning they were not able to get it up to anything that you might consider code. So one of the things that I know was in that famous eight page summary was the fact that while Roosevelt's inspectors were there, there were like these open kind of latrine areas for workers that were just out on the floor. And some workers were moving, I think it was a hog, it was either a hog or a cow, but they were moving an animal carcass across the floor, lost their grip, it fell into the latrine, they uh, picked it up out of the latrine and just put it back on the line. And one of Roosevelt's inspectors, uh, this was in the New York Times story about this, you said, aren't you at least going to wash it? He said, no, nah, no, nah, you know, we're going to use all these chemical additives and everything will be fine. And so there were a lot of, even after this so-called cleanup, just the way they ran those plants, right? They just couldn't clean up everything to a degree that made it look like this wonderful sterile operation because it wasn't. Yep. Okay, so um, if Harvey Wiley were alive today, how would he rate our current food safety system? Well, that's a great question. I mean, Harvey Wiley was never satisfied with what he had accomplished. I. Or, or the improvements that followed that law. I mean, he, he was a man who, his standards were, you know, very, very high and, and he was dissatisfied with what had resulted uh, to the time of his death. He actually wrote a book right before he died called a, a History of the Crime Against the Food Law. I don't think he would be 100% satisfied today. I, we do so many things and, I think we suffer from regulatory memory failure in that we don't actually fully appreciate what all of these regulations have brought us. You know, sometimes I think we use regulation in a pejorative term when we should just say consumer protection. Uh, we've come a long way since then, and I do think he would celebrate what we have accomplished, and I don't think he would be satisfied. I think he would uh, worry that some of the safety nets we've put in place to have been undermined or rolled back. And I think he would want, given modern science, and modern science can do so much that they can't do then, you know, to see us really put it to good work and, and make the food supply even safer than it is. I know he would think that. And I talk to a lot of American consumers when I go out and do book talks, you know, who still aren't confident in the food supply which tells us that, you know, we still have work to do. I think he would believe that. And I think he would be just as loud and obnoxious and pushy about that now as he was then. I kind of like that. <laughs> um, I have a few more questions. Can you still answer some, Deborah? I'm are, happy. Are you, I just want to make sure you have time. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Um, it seems that what happened in 1906 was a great example of the federal government acting in response to public outrage. Yes. Do you think we can ever get to that kind of unified action again? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I have thought that so many of the steps forward we've taken in regulation have been in response to unified public outrage, right? The 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act followed a big scandal involving toxic cough syrup for children that, you know, w fell through the cracks of the 1906 law. The EPA followed a number of environmental scandals, and there was this sense that we were all in this together. 
I, you know, if you follow the news today, I worry that we are more fragmented than that. But in fact, I know we are, you know, and we tend because our sources of information are so fragmented in particular, and because digital communication uh, facilitates misinformation in ways that certainly wasn't true then. Not that there wouldn't have been misinformation then and there was. Um, it's just that we're better at it, I guess, uh, to worry about that. But I will tell you that what does give me hope that we're eventually going to get our feedback under us is if you look at some of the polls, you do find, I, I'm in thinking of things like some of the let's stay safe together, stay at home kind of orders, that a majority of people that support those. And there was a recent poll that looked at public support for governor's actions. And you found again that a majority of people, you know, Mike DeWine in Ohio, who took some very strict steps early on, had the highest rating of any governor in the state. And the governor who had the lowest was uh, Brian Kemp from Georgia. I'm from Georgia, so of course I took this personally. Um, but, but I think that tells us that that's still there, right? That we haven't lost that sense of, you know, compute communal recognition that most of us were good common sense Americans, that that's still there underlying all of this fragmentation and anger. And that if we work at it, and, and if we continue to push in that direction, I know I'm gonna sound very Pollyanna when I say this, I'm hoping we can rebuild that, you know, and make use of what I think is still there that's kind of been pushed to aside under all of the angst and divisiveness of our time. I really hope that. Okay. Um, so uh, this person says one of the things that struck you struck him or her in this book. Uh, was the reasons the food industry gave for opposing the Pure Food Act. Um, they're similar to what you hear today. Cost, reformulation can't be done, running email for small firms out of business. Can you talk a little more about industry opposition and how it was overcome? Sure, and that's an insightful point. There was... When I started working on this book, I thought I'm going to write this book about this amazing moment in history. And then I started realizing that, that you know, it was very parallel to what goes on today. Uh, so what happened to change industry opposition at that time? Some of it was that, you know, the incredible political pressure from that unified American um, uh, recognition that this had to change, right? That that actually outweighed even the behind the scenes handshake and the and the money and and the contributions and the industry opposition, that there was a recognition that the American public was not going to put up with this and that politicians were going to have to respond to this, right? That was part of it. Uh, there was uh, also the different alliances, you know, you ha actually had very organized groups, including some industry groups. I, I, you know, there was industry opposition, but you also saw not just Heinz, but some of the other industry groups saying, if our industry is going to survive this, we have to fix this problem or people are not going to buy that buy our products. And in fact, the canning industry, interestingly enough, which had been very opposed in the beginning, you know, was one of the groups that really came forward and pushed for the wall. So you saw in the, at the same time that you saw a more unified public reaction, you started to see industry opposition also fragment some. And I think that made a big difference. And then, although I have talked uh, you know, without a great deal of enthusiasm about uh, the legislators of the time. You know, this legislation passed because there were members of the government who, despite industry pressure, uh, thought this was the right thing to do, right? The uh, congressman who brought forward the Food and Drug Act was uh, from, a, I think it was Montana, 
or Wyoming, a Western state. And he had very strong feelings in particular about the dis fraud in the drug industry and all of his, uh, all the people he represented who he felt were, you know, being really harmed by this. So you also saw, you know, some very upright legislators and you saw some of the professional groups like the Association of um, State Food and Drug Officials, but also the AMA was hugely influential. And in fact, the AMA in this final push for the law met with members of Congress and said, if you don't do this, we're gonna have our individual doctors telling their patients not to vote for you. So you saw this very effective moment where there were all the people on, on what I'm gonna saw on the right side came together and the opposition was starting to fragment. Wow. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take a couple more questions. Um, this one is how did chemists determine the con contaminants in food so long ago? Were there distillation type procedures? You know, it's very interesting. And if you get, I, I'm the only journalist, I think, in the United States. Uh, you can buy Wiley's Bulletin 13s on Amazon and, uh, you know, uh, print to pay versions. <laughs> and I bought all of them so I could sticker them up and mark them up in my nerdy way. Um, but if you get into the um, uh, appendices of those, they walk through their techniques. It's really fascinating. Uh, you know, some of the devices they use, like uh, polariscopes, um, the microscopic differences between a, uh, you know, a grain of pepper versus a grain of bone versus, I mean, they put those images into the reports, in addition to some of the um, different chemical techniques than they use. So, you know, there's, it's a really, the indices of those books are really, detailed, terrific portrait of uh, the different techniques they used at the time. And those were really pioneered in Europe. Wiley, um, while he was at Purdue, had actually gone on a sabbatical and studied in one of the great food chemistry laboratories of Germany and bought equipment there that wasn't available at that point in the United States with his own money. So he actually brought some of these kind of innovative techniques back to the United States. Hmm. So um, I have a kind of a combination question about the staff lunches. Um, did anyone die as a result? And then the second part of that question is, um, did they do the staff lunches willingly? And did they know they were part of an experiment? So these would be these poison squad guys. Um, and they knew they were part of the experiment. In fact, Wiley, despite his professions that he did not think, you know, the borax, for instance, was dangerous, they, they all had to sign a waiver of liability, let, excusing the federal government if they got sick or died. Um, so the way these were set up is, and, and they walked through, uh, you know, what they were going to be testing. They did have an interesting design for these experiments in which um, uh, not only did the um, volunteers in the poison squad, oh, they weren't entirely volunteers, they got $5 a month. Um, but the uh, these young men in these poison squad experiments, they had to, uh, they could only eat in this dining room while we set up. They got three meals a day, seven days a week. They were banned from going out and eating or drinking anywhere else except for water. They had to be attested by doctors uh, with, they. I think they started out by using military public health doctors and then eventually Wiley and his staff did all the testing, but they were weighed, they had to collect their urine, they had to collect their feces, they took hair samples, they took blood samples. Right, so they were heavily medically monitored um, throughout. And so sometimes when you look at everything they had to do, I think I just can't believe that anyone would sign up for this, but they did get, like people wrote in from all over the country when they announced this, pick me, pick me, I'm a perfect person. I have a cast iron stomach, I can eat anything. I mean, 
reading the letters they got is really, you know, amazing and kind of entertaining. I don't think that anyone, including Wiley, knew, except barring formaldehyde for sure, uh, how dangerous these things were, right? I mean, Wiley himself said he hadn't realized how dangerous borax was. So, you know, they were informed, but, you know, in the terms of, by the way, we're, teach we're feeding you something that, you know, might really impair your health. I don't think they got full information because I don't think anyone had it. I went through a lot of, you know, what was the knowledge and what were the experiments extant when he started these experiments. And if you, and you'll see in the book, it was pretty thin and sketchy material. Um, none of these guys died uh, while they were being tested. Uh, there was one, member of the poison squad who died, I think within a year after the experiment and his mother blamed the exposures, but he had some underlying health issues that were probably people felt when they looked at that case were more important. And most of them got, some of them got pretty sick. I mean, hospital level sick, especially with formaldehyde, but mm -hmm. all of them recovered and uh, went on to as far as we know, live normal lives. And I will tell you, I think that's probably one of the failings of this experiment is that they weren't followed. Once they were tested, once the experiment ended, no one followed them in a long-term sense. And that would have been a brilliant thing to do. Well, um, we have many more questions. <laughs> so I guess, Deborah, I'd like to invite you to come back <laughs> because because there are many so um yeah I, i'd be happy to do that and you know uh do a condensed uh version of this talk i realized it took about 40 minutes uh for people who wanted to come back um just hit some of the high points and do a q a i really would be happy to do that i mean i have to tell you again you guys are probably one of my favorite audiences for this at all time because I think people really get it and the questions are always so smart and interesting. So it's a pleasure for me. Well, Deborah, I, I again enjoyed it. I, I always find um, your stories fascinating and um, I appreciate everyone who has attended today. Um, there are more webinars to be had from AFTO. So please go to the AFTO homepage at afto.org, there's a professional development section on the, um, the homepage that will allow you to see what we're doing every week. And every week we are doing um, many webinars on different topics. And I hope you will join us again in the future. And if you're interested, um, Deborah also did a podcast and that can be found um, in the AFTO podcast. So um, again, thank you everybody for attending and Deborah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you, it's really, I'm, when I said it was a pleasure, I meant it. Thank you for having me on. Okay, thanks everyone.